Gameplay Learn. Now with soothing waterfall music. Hi, welcome to Gameplay Learn, where we bring you the latest news, research, events, and job postings in the educational gaming field. In this episode, we're going to talk about games to teach sexual education. We'll also talk about a Disney incubator for educational game startups. We'll talk about grants that you can apply for from the U.S. government if you are creating educational games. We'll mention a United Nations app competition to build a peace-promoting app. We'll also talk about how virtual reality can revolutionize learning. Our final segment will be on games to analyze history, plus our game of the month, which is an interactive story about the yellow fever epidemic in 18th century Philadelphia. Thanks to all our partners and collaborators for sending us news to incorporate into this episode, including the Games Learning Society Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Oklahoma's K-20 Center, and Carnegie Mellon's Entertainment Technology Center. If you belong to a research and development center that does work on serious games, you should become our partner. All right, now for the news. So a game that's really successful at getting people to read difficult text is Minecraft. So the game has sold 50 million copies, and its three authorized guides, Minecraft Essential Handbook, Minecraft Redstone Handbook, and Minecraft Construction Handbook, have sold more than 6 million copies combined in store sales and purchases made through clubs and school fairs, according to its publisher, Scholastic. Arizona State University James Paul G., who's one of the leaders of the, the Center for Games and Impact, has spoken about how games can lead to learning outside of the actual game by motivating people to read wikis and forums about the game. The University of Wisconsin's Constance Steinkohler, who's the head of the Games Learning Society Lab, has research that shows kids being able to read text at a much more advanced level than usual when it's about a game they like. And so for their love of Minecraft, players will watch videos, post and read forums and gameplay guides, and teach each other how to build all sorts of neat things, leading to a ton of learning outside of the game. There's a competition to build apps that promote and examine peace that's sponsored by the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, the United Nations Development Program, and Build Up. The competition awards the winning entries $15,000 in cash prices and offers mentoring, advising, and publicity from the Games for Change organization. The winners were announced at the Build Peace Conference in Cyprus. You can check our website for the list of winners. Virtual reality continues to expand. Google led a half a billion dollar investment in a company called Magic Leap, based in Florida. Uh, virtual reality is being used in all sorts of fields for all purposes, including by researchers at the University of Houston to help people overcome addiction by immersing them in environments where they would encounter addiction triggers. There's a company in the UK called 4D Creative that builds immersive customizable pods for classrooms where any image or simulation can be projected on. At the Stanford University Education Technology Meetup a few weeks ago, the head of the university's virtual rea reality research lab, Jeremy Balenson, gave a talk on 20 years of research related to improving education through virtual reality and how the emergence of Oculus and other headsets would expand the use of virtual reality since prices for these devices are in the $300 to $500 range. Professor Balenson gave a number of examples of how virtual reality could improve learning. So one example is what's called the virtual reality gaze. And so experiments show that students pay more attention to a lecturer if the lecturer looks at them in the eye. In a classroom of 50 students, a lecturer can only look at each student one or two percent of the time. But with virtual reality, you can increase that to any percentage you want for every student. You just program the virtual imagery of the lecturer that each student sees. Another example he gave was something called digital mimicry. You know, we tend to like and pay more attention to people that m mimic the way we move and the way we, we say things. So that's really easy to create in virtual reality. He also spoke of what's called the optimal colleague effect where if we see others around us studying, we're more likely to study. 
in virtual reality, it's also easier to create an environment that overcomes stereotype disadvantage. What happens when you go into a room and uh, no one actually looks like you and you kind of subconsciously assume that people like you are not there because they're, they're bad at whatever the people in that room are doing at that subject. And so virtual reality can help correct this. He also talked about um, how recording student movement can be used to predict outcomes and learning, and that this could be a novel way to assess and evaluate learning. And he finished his talk by highlighting how virtual reality created a sense of embodiment and identification that's critical for learning. So the U.S. government gives out grants to all sorts of startups that are creating serious games. So if you're creating one, you should apply for a grant from the Small Business Administration, from the National Science Foundation, from the National Institutes of Health, the De DARPA, the Department of Defense, the Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences, and the Treasury Department. So go to our site, GameplayLearn.com, for links to these grant programs. Disney has a startup accelerator open to initiatives related to media. It's a 15-week program, and this year, each startup received mentoring from Disney's network of companies, along with $120,000 in funding. A few of the current startups in the 2014 cohort of the Disney Accelerator are educational gaming initiatives. So if you're interested, visit DisneyAccelerator.com. There's enough history games out there to build an entire K-12 curricula using just games. There are games like Civilization that simulate history, and there are games like Minecraft that are used to recreate history. There are a ton of websites related to studying history by playing games, including playthepast.org. I particularly recommend Troy Goodfellow's article on his own site, analyzing how nation's histories influence how they are portrayed or can be played in strategy games. There's a terrific book called Gaming the Past, which explains how to incorporate history games into schools. Its author, Jeremiah McCall, gave a great presentation a few years ago at the Games Learning Society Conference at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And a short history game on the American Civil War recently won an award at the Meaningful Play Conference at Michigan State University. And Valiant Hearts, The Great War, a game on World War I, got two awards at the 2014 Game Awards. Our Game of the Month is a wonderful interactive story called The Fever, in which you play a young doctor trying to save his family while treating patients during the devastating yellow fever epidemic in 18th century Philadelphia. The creator of The Fever, Rachel Ponce, did graduate work at the University of Chicago on the history of medicine. The game is terrific. It's a lot of fun, even uses uh, gamification in effective ways to increase replayability. The most important part of the game is how it manages to convey through gameplay the feeling of panic when a deadly epidemic is killing people all around you, including your family. You embody a doctor and experience what it's like to live through that difficult time. For links to the fever and to the history games and sites and resources that we just mentioned, visit our site. Meditation is very useful to relax, center oneself, and it's been scientifically proven to heal emotional and mental illnesses like depression. I teach Stanford's four credit meditation class and for the past few years have tried a number of meditation games and simulations. One of the ones I really love and have featured as Game of the Month a few episodes back was Deepak Chopra's Leela, which used the Kinect to recognize if you were breathing properly. It's terrific. Another meditation resource I really like is the Buddhist island in Second Life. It's lovely, peaceful, and offers free me meditations guided by a teacher that's controlling an avatar. There's a couple of virtual reality meditation games that are actually coming up that use the Oculus Rift to increase immersion. One of them won the most innovative game award at the Meaningful Play Conference at Michigan State University. Another called Deep uses both the Oculus and a peripheral that tracks the player's breathing to influence the game. Another of these Oculus-based meditation games that will soon be released is called Sound Self, 
you play it by meditative chanting. We have links to all these on our site. There are a number of games that teach concepts related to sexuality. Some of these games and simulations are web-based, some are tablet-based, some are card games, some are graphically accurate with regards to anatomy and sexuality, and others are more abstract and suggestive. A number of these games were created in game jams. So let's review a couple of them. Merit Copas has a simple text game that highlights the importance of getting your partner's explicit consent when engaging in sex. Nikki Case has a nice short game on coming out of the closet. Lindsay Grace at American University's Game Lab has a game about safe sex called Leslie the Lover that's playable on Android devices. Then there's Happy Playtime, a game for girls to learn how to masturbate in which users simulate various techniques by moving their fingers over their touch screens in certain patterns and at certain pace. Another game is How Do You Do It, which is about a kid imagining how sex is like by manipulating her dolls. A masterpiece of the sexuality genre is a game called Dysphoria, which is a very clever and original simulation of what it's like to go through hormone replacement therapy for transgender individuals. Luxuria Superbia is a wonderful and colorful game that deals with the importance of pacing and self-control during sex. In it, you use your fingers to touch flowers in a magical tunnel that talks dirty to you in the loveliest of ways. Then there's Queer Power by Molindustria, which highlights the concept of individual variability when it comes to attraction or lack of attraction to different genders and bodies. There's a card game by Naomi Clark called Consentacle, about aliens and their slippery tentacles. In Consentacle, you also deal with issues of consent, pleasure, and even incorporate a, a few kinky sex acts. There's also games that even though they don't actually teach you much about sex, they might help break the ice and make an issue less taboo. One of these games is called Tampon Run, where your character has to run around throwing tampons at people. In related news, the University of New Hampshire recently got a half a million dollar grant to develop an education game to prevent sexual harassment on campus. A 2013 National Parent Survey conducted by the Joan Gans Cooney Center, which is part of the Sesame Workshop, found that 71% of young children live in a home that contains at least one smartphone, and 55% of children have access to tablets. So the same survey indicated that 35% of children between the ages of 2 and 10 use educational apps at least once a week. A 2014 teacher survey by the Cooney Center found that 74% of K-8 through K-8 teachers report using digital games, 80% of these teachers use games at least once a month, and 55% of these teachers use them once a week. There's a couple of good websites that review games for learning, including Common Sense Media, Parents' Choice, and of course Metacritic, which reviews all sorts of media. We have come to the end of this episode of Gameplay Learn. We also have a newsletter version of the show, which you can subscribe to on our website, and a YouTube version with images of the topics the news is about. If you want, also ch check out our Twitter. We update it with educational games job postings, upcoming events, and other announcements and articles we sometimes don't include in the show. If you have any tips on news, events, job openings, and other things related to the field that you think we should cover, Send us a message through the contact form on our site, GameplayLearn.com. Thanks again for listening. Feel free to share this podcast with your favorite people in the educational gaming field. We'll be back soon. Take care.